Yes, people, welcome back to another Arsenal-related video. Today, I've got a very special new series on the channel. It is the Tactical Analysis, brought with my good friend Rami from the Stats Optic. He's got his own Instagram and Twitter page, which I'm sure he'll tell you more about. And today, we're going to be talking about Arsenal versus Nottingham Forest, the two-on win, the full, complete breakdown. Rami, how are you doing today? Good. Lovely to be on. Hopefully, this is the start of something exciting. Of course, yeah, of course. I need to get in, provide some insights, see... Yeah, see what Arsenal are going to be competing with for the rest of the season. Hopefully yeah, hundred percent. And let us know your thoughts in the comment section regarding the game. What do you think of it? How do you think Arsenal set up, Forest set up, and what do you see going forward? And of course, make sure you follow uh, Rami his page, the Stats Optic. He's on Instagram and Twitter. I'll leave links to both in the description of this video, as well as his YouTube channel, which will be tagged in the top of this video as well. So let's get straight into it with our first slide. Coming here, Rami, talk me through what you're seeing right here that Arsenal doing the way they've set up formation wise. So, I think the whole identity of what Mikel Arteta wants to do is sustain pressure. I think mm. his understanding of his idea, his identity is keep the ball in the final thirds as much as we can and penetrate the teams in behind. Because what we're going to find is a lot of the season is these teams are going to want to sit back, especially when we're playing at home. They're going to sit mm. back. Five, five back, five back, five four one. A lot of the time, we saw it last season as well. And what Mikel was going to want to do is he introduced a new identity this season, similar to what Pep actually did at the opening game against Burnley, was introduce a three one six, and mm. in a way, it was introducing a diamond formation in midfield. So we would play out the back with Timber. In this case, it was Timber, Saliba, Ben White, and. What was really interesting was to see the rotations in midfield. We had parties sitting in the six, sitting in front of the defence. And we had Declan Rice as a left centre mid supporting Martinelli and Timber. Mm. Kai Havertz was essentially what we all thought he would be, is a second striker. And he was sat right in behind Nketia in the 10 role. And obviously Martin Odegaard on the right centre mid. So, yeah, the idea was really to just possession, possession, possession. And we saw it. 79% possession all game. Forest only had 21%. And through that, we were hoping to create chances. And we were able to really sustain the pressure really well in the in our own half, especially in the first half. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. But the amount of times we saw Martinelli, Saka, running back, getting the ball back, winning it back after we would take, you know, a risky pass to try and get it in behind. And yeah, I think, I think Arsenal did really well. Like the scoreboard might not have, shown that in just a 2-1 result but it was a masterclass in possession <laughs> I don't think yeah. we could have been any better you're right 100% when we play against teams like Forest, it'll be the same with other teams towards the bottom of the table it's all about breaking them down they're going to sit back in their low block recycle it from left to right especially when Saka and Martin get the ball they're going to want to double up on them and that was when, when it was really important that Erdgaard, Partey all got involved on the right-hand side. Similarly, Kai Havertz, of course, Declan Rice helping out on the left with Martinelli. That was really important. Another thing I want to touch on uh, about is this. In this game right here, Timber was used, as you said, along the back three with Ben White and Sleeper, whereas in the Community Shield, Timber was the one slot into midfield. So do you see Timber more playing in the back three? Or do you see maybe if Gabriel was playing, he would be the one to slot into midfield and then it become Gabriel, Ben White and Saliba across the back. What did you think of Timber in that role? Obviously, he only played 45 minutes because he was injured in the second half. I think it's going to depend on the opposition. I feel like if we're starting to face teams that want to sit back like we did against Forrest, we're mm. going to see Timber playing in the back three. But if we're going to, have, if we're going to want to control transitions a bit better, because in this in this like type of scenario, we're not really going to face much counter-attacks against us. So mm. in this scenario, we're not going to need another midfielder or play like a box midfield. What we saw in the community shield was we saw a 3-2-2-5 two, two, mm. where both Parice and Party were sitting in front of the defence and we had the, in the two forward positions, we had obviously Erdegaard and... Um, even Havertz was playing interchanging into that position as well. But I do see Timber playing more in the inverted role. We'll see more in the weeks go by. I think when we start to play teams like Villa, we start to play teams like Newcastle, where we don't really need that type of, you know, his technical ability is needed more within the midfield rather than yeah. you know, playing at the back. But yeah, I think that's what we're going to see in a bit more. Perfect. Well, let's move on to the next image we've got here. 
Um, yeah. Another screenshot, as you're as you're saying, well, talk us through this one. What you're seeing right here shows again the the obviously the banks of the attack from Arsenal. So I think what it was really the difference was Thomas Partey is off this picture, but Thomas Partey started as a right back, and in defensive transition, he was the right back, which mm. did out, did catch us out a few times where they were both yeah. in with Brennan Johnson when the striker from Nottingham Forest came on in the second half, even yeah, when. Even when Elanga was coming on, that's where the goal yeah. came from Nottingham Forest in the second half, was from that channel. And they were mm -hmm. playing balls at the end. But what I saw here was, again, the three back, but party was used more out wide as a width option. And what the width option allows us to do was pay balls from White to party to Saka. We'll see that later on. But the advantage that Arsenal wanted was the wingers 1v1. And we wanted to match up Martinelli with Aurea and we wanted to match up Saka with the fullback. And we back mm. up forward now. They're more than enough capable to take these on one-on-one. -on -one. But in these cases, sometimes we even saw 2v1, 3v1s. And, but they're more than capable enough. I think our, what we did so well was allowing Erdegaard and Havertz to run in behind, allowing for the space in behind to, come in, to allow the wingers to cut in. And that's how Saka scored the goal. Allowed mm. Martinelli as well. To come in, create the first first goal with uh, Nketiah. So yeah, I, I saw a different shape created, and I think that's the advantage that the diamond gives us in the midfield. It allows us interchangeability, which is really, really the best thing that we can do. I think we're the most flexible team in the world right now when it comes to build up. Yeah, you're hundred percent right, especially because both our goals came from the wings. Yeah. When Martinelli get a double team, obviously he he did the skill move. I'm 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 gonna give him the benefit of the doubt and it went to Enketi. Yeah. I think he tried to do it to himself, yeah. really. And of course, Saka recycled from the set piece. Saliba yeah. Partey, Saka play with it in the corner. Saka gets an opening, mm. gets a run on the wing back Aina, who I actually thought had a decent game to be fair, yeah. and then bent it top in. So you're 100 percent right. Mm. If we can get our wingers isolated, that should be the main option. And if they're getting double teamed, recycle it quickly to the other side because there's gonna be an yeah. overload. Overload exactly. there. Yeah. Okay, let's let's move forward. So this is mm. obviously showing the, the back three then with White, Saliba, Timbers you talked about, but then also Partey and Rice slotting into midfield. Mm. So do you think Partey long-term at right-back is an option? Because you mentioned earlier how he can slot into midfield and be that body, but at right-back, he's still a bit of a liability. There were times you mm. said when Brendan Johnson skinned him and even when Alanga came on the pitch, was looking dangerous against Partey. So do you think that long-term it should be Partey as a CDM and Rice in that, in that eight role that Xhaka was playing? Or do you like this system where Rice is in the six and then you've got Havertz and Erdgaard and Partey remains at right back? I think what it is, it's availability. I think Gabriel was injured mm. a little bit. Um, so I think really, I wouldn't play par Partey in the right back. I think it leaves us a bit too defensively like weak in random transitions, especially when we're up against it in the second half. We really saw it. It was a bit tough. So I think... The future for our, really our team is going to be having Gabriel in the left centre back where he's amazing at pinging balls in the channels into Martinelli. I think they have a great link up, which I don't think we should really like disrupt. I think mm. the, the centre back that plays in the middle could be Ben White, could be Saliba. I think Saliba had this role today that was really like, put on him <laughs> I think it was like the most like uh he was given like a leadership role in a sense in playing the central center back because usually he plays in the right channel as a cent as the right center back so I think in the future we will see more of this shape I think for now Arteta will trust what he did at the back end of last season and in the community shield is playing Gabriel White and Saliba as the back three but I see the midfield with Rice and Party. I think it allows us to be so hard to be broken down. The, the mm. recovery, we saw it against City, the recoveries that Rice and Party were doing together was just like immense. It, would, it was making City so hard to allow, you know, to pay right through us. <laughs> the only options that we would have is pay right through our like fullbacks. And even then we'd have Saka and Martinelli pressing. Saka made the most tackles, five tackles against Forrest of any outfield player. So I think it shows that what the future is going to be is going to be this back three with the diamond or the two. So we either build up in a 3-1 or a 3-2. And mm. depends what the pressing shape of the opposition team really is. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point as well. 
I do think it's Crystal Palace that should Gabriel recover and be fit, I would like to see Partey move into midfield and either Nketiah or Havertz drop yeah. down to the bench because I think that will make us more resilient, as you said, especially to teams that try and counter-attack us and try and play against us in transition, which which is what Chris Palace will do, especially away from home as well. They're going to be physical. So I think today we got away with it, having Partey right back. But long term, I don't think it's the right strategy either, to be honest with you, especially in, in bigger games. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And this, I'm guessing this is when we see Arsenal in build-up, actually, as they start to attack. So talk us, talk us through this one, Rami, what you see here with Ben White on the football. Yeah, so I think what we did really well was keep the width. And what the width allows us to do is play through the middle. The mm. options would do, it would create the fullbacks of opposition teams in two minds. Either they're with the fullback or they're slotting in and making it compact. But what it allows us to do is if they come into the middle, we just play the ball out wide and then we've, we've got a one-on-one. -on -one. But what was really well done here, and I think we, see, we will see this a lot through the season, is diagonal runs. The diagonal run of Martinelli coming across we saw the Zerbi really put this and implement the system in Brighton when he first came in because they were lacking goals. It's the diagonal runs from the wing coming right across the full, right across the def like the central defenders, leaves them in. If you're standing against them, it, it's really tough to read. So what White did really well was come inverted and play the ball right in behind into Martinelli. Again, this chance didn't really lead to much, but I think what it shows is the dynamic abilities of our wingers to just come in and read the read the game really well. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. And look how many bodies are in the centre of the pitch there. Yeah. Only yeah. when you're a defender, right, everyone big picks up someone. As you yeah. said, so Jorio picks up Martinelli, you got Elena on Saka, and then the three centre-backs are occupying and Ketia, Erdgaard, Havertz. When you got yeah. Martinelli running in as he is there and then actually becoming a right winger with that run, yeah. who picks him up? Is it zonal? Is it man-to-man? -man? So it's definitely important to be fluid and you're 100% right. It, although it might not lead to something, definitely creates some doubt in the defender's mind, which is, which is good going forward. You need to have a dynamic team that makes a lot of runs because it ties the defenders, not necessarily physically, but also mentally, having yeah. to keep your concentration with all the runs going on. It's really yeah. important as well. Okay, so this, I thought this was a goal at the time when yeah. he showed me this, but it's only the seventh minute, but I guess this was a warning sign for the goal that could come. No. I think so it's last was great, here. It was great interchangeability. I think what we had was overload and attack. We had obviously Nottingham Forest, their aim of the game, which we'll see later on, is mm. they wanted to play long from goal kicks. And yeah. they wanted to win in the air. But what we have now is Arteta's amazing like, scout. Scouting is buying players that are cool and can deal with physicality. So when we're facing teams that sit five back, we have six in attack now. We have six attackers essentially playing against them. So we have an overload in attack. Now that's what we have is our great advantage. So what happened here was, I believe, Party played the ball into Saka. Saka made the run diagonally across. And Boy had two movements, two really key movements that dragged the defenders forward and created the space for Nketiah. Is Havertz came in as the first vertical run. And then when that came along, it opened more space in behind the defenders to allow Nketiah to come through. Again, with a better final ball, Nketiah made them, maybe made them more like of the chance. But the defender did well to track Nketiah's run after that. Yeah, I remember this play. It was when Saka played it through and then it yeah. just gave it to Nketiah, but it, it just fell through. But you're right, yeah. that was the warning signs for an absolute mm -hmm. fact. And now we're moving here later on in the game. So talk me through what's happening here. Obviously, we can see that Arsenal were basically camped in Nottingham Forest half, which was mm -hmm. the majority of the game, to be honest. So how were Arsenal able to then break the, break Forest down having been camped in their half for the majority of this game? What is the movement that's going on here? See, so the movement here is... is... I think the best that a 3 one, 6 can offer in, and the diamond formation can offer in midfield is when one player comes forward and you're getting man marked one-to-one -to -one because that's what essentially what Nottingham Forest wants to do is they want to go up with the man. They want to stay tight as possible. So what Havertz and Declan Rice did really well is Saliba carried the ball and now you're standing off. The defenders are standing off. They don't know who the ball is coming to. Mm. Once the pass is made, movement is created in behind. So Bryce came forward, saw the play, and it unleashed <laughs> unleashed Havertz to go right through. And I think that was the, the best thing that like the diamond formation can offer is that intricate passing that we can play right through them and on the wings. Yes, definitely. No, really interesting. Because there were times when Rice was the furthest man forward, even when mm. he came to pressing the goalkeeper. Yeah. And that makes sense if Partey's in the team. But we're not obviously the formation was with Havertz and 
Odegaard mm-hmm. in midfield. When I saw Rice furthest forward, I was a little bit worried thinking, look, if we get caught out here, heading out the mm-hmm. press, fair enough, it is Forest, so it's not the most dangerous team to do it to. But still, mm-hmm. you're looking at Rice getting bypassed in midfield and there is no midfield after that. Yeah. So it, it is risky, but I guess it works at times. It gives a different edge to us, an absolute fact. So here going forward, you can see Partey's on the football. He's got Saka to his right, Erdogan mm-hmm. there as well. So where's Erdogan signaling to that? Is he, is he trying to, say, pass around the corner to Enketia? So what he did really well here was this was in transition coming out of our, of our own like our own half, and mm. Edgar did really well to do a bit of skill. Party came inverted again, and he read the play really well. He put himself in a position where it's in between the midfielders of of Nottingham Forest and the defenders, mm. and he's fun. He uses body feints, which is such a key move these days in order to just yeah. fall under and moving away. And he paid a beautiful ball that threaded Inketia right in. And I think it was a chance where he it was just wide. But um, yeah, movement again. It came Inketia was up against the back line and he created the vertical run. Odegaard spun the def- like spun the defender 1v1 and threaded the ball in. But yeah, here is just individual brilliance. I think we lacked Odegaard's individual brilliance in the first season. And now he's taken that captain's armband and deciding, you know, this is his moment to shine. Yeah, and to really dictate matches. You're 100% mm. right. I've always said this. I said, if Arsenal to win matches, it's no coincidence that those are the same games that Erdgaard takes control of. Yeah. When he's on the football, good things tend to happen. Exactly. So get him in the game early, get him involved, and then he'll start to get other players unlocked as well. And those are the best players, right? The Bruyne is the Erdgaard, Fabregas was the same. Those players that make players around them better. Exactly. A real catch yeah. for the team. And that embodies Erdgaard 100%. Okay, so here, this, is, this I believe is the second goal, right? This is the second goal. This is the Saka's brilliance. I think the XG was so low <laughs> that we had a lower XG than Forrest yeah. at the end of the first half. Um, yeah, I think what we did really well is came back, I think, Saliba winning back the possession after the corner and he absolutely hunted the man down. So it's that counter-press ability that we have in the own half. We hunt teams down and mm. it's usable back so quickly and here's just individual brilliance. You can't coach this. It's just Saka... Deciding he is the man now. He needs to take more shots outside the penalty area. And yeah. What more, more can you said? Yeah, 100%. No, you're right. Because one thing that really impressed me about Arsenal this game is our ability to win the ball back when losing it so quickly. Mm. Whenever we lost the ball, we hunted in packs. It was like sharks. Four or five people chasing down the ball instantly. And that's become synonymous with Pep Guardiola at Barcelona, Pep Guardiola yeah. at Man City. That case of win the ball as soon as you lose it because that's when the team is most vulnerable. And I think that could be very mentally fatiguing as well. Look, you mentioned earlier mm-hmm. that Arsenal had 80, 81% of the ball here, uh, here today, right? Or against Forest on the weekend. Yeah. And when you know you haven't got a lot of the football, as soon as you get it back, you want a breather. But if Arsenal yeah. go win it straight back off you, not only is it physically fatiguing because you have to chase the ball around again, it's mentally fatiguing. You know, you've just chased it for mm-hmm. two minutes. You have the ball back yeah. for two, three seconds, then you're chasing it again. And I think that's so important. If we get once have control over games and dominance, you have mm-hmm. to win the ball back as soon as you lose it. And that was, it showed, as soon as we won that ball back, Straight to Saka, and he, as you said, he did the magic. But also, I believe Saka Martinelli was so key defensively in this game, mm. tracking back, winning the ball back instantly. You said before, you said Saka had five ball recoveries, which was mm. the most out of any outfield player in that game. And it just goes to show, man, Saka Martinelli, when they've got their job defensively locked on as well, we become a much better team, much more balanced team as well, which is so important. And yeah, as you said, what a goal by Saka, just bent around the defender. If he can add that to his locker consistently, I mean, I'm predicting 20 plus goals this season. What do you think? Do you think he's going to reach that benchmark yeah. as well? Yeah, I think he needs to have that season that Gareth Bale, Iron Robin, those type of just strikes he needs to add to his game. Exactly. He needs to just mm. be ruthless. Take those chances. 100%. 100%. Okay, so yeah, what's so, happening here then? Yeah, so this is a two part. I think what we need to see here right now is party and white, very interchangeable. Mm. Party plays the ball. If you go to the next slide. Okay. Plays the ball right into Saka, and Ben White follows on the overlap. Oh, this yes, is the key. Yeah. This is this was the key to the game. I feel like playing against the fullbacks that are maybe not as defensively aware and in transition, they're going to be vulnerable in the spaces and behind. Saka mm. has more than enough ability to take them on one v one. Adding White creates a, a psychological effect into the defender's mind, especially when he doesn't have his extra defender with him to cover the space. That was there. So, yeah, I think this is what the options that we had was Saka could go in, in behind the defender, or he could play white. And I think what he did was in this game, I think he played white. 
Uh, on yeah, he did. I remember because White was going through. We didn't end up scoring from it, but that was just yeah. one of the warning signs. Then, yeah, yeah, and that reminds me a lot of what Arsenal were doing last season, right? Which is mm -hmm. having White alongside Saka. Yeah. They built up a partnership now. They built exactly. up a real good partnership there, especially Odegaard as well, because those three used to interchange a lot in triangles. I think yeah. if Martelli and whoever the left back is going to be, if it's Zinchenko, Timber, whoever it's going to be going forward, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. Timber's injured now. It could be Tommy Asu even. I think if they can build up a partnership with Havertz, whoever's on the left hand side, Rice. That would be so important. Because we do look a little bit lopsided where we do attack a lot down the right. Mm. So maybe that should be something that we try to target going forward for sure. And so, okay, so this is what they say in terms of like the, the field tilt or the attacking yeah. areas, right? It was just a threat that we had, I think, all game. If Arsenal fans were a bit worried after the game about the score, mm. I wouldn't worry too much. We yeah. created the biggest chances all game. We had control. There was nothing that we really need to really worry about too much. I think the only thing that we have was that in the second half when we're up against it, we need to be more ruthless. We had so many chances to score. Uh, Arsenal were more than in favour to score in so many of those in those like scenarios. Havertz should have buried a few goals. Martinelli as well before before he came off. But um, yeah, when we're up against it, I think we we did well hindsight but yeah i think in control i think our biggest key to creating chances is just being able to just keep ourselves in the half and look at <laughs> look at it. it it backs the point of sustained pressure i think that's mm. if you're taking away anything that shows that shows it really yeah no i 100 percent agree with you here the game today look oh the game sorry the game on the weekend mm. i wasn't worried when it ended winning 2-1 i wasn't sitting there going oh this performance yeah. doesn't look like a team that can win the league. I saw enough in the game to see the positives. The fact we were sustaining pressure, we were winning the ball back as soon as we lost it, we were mm -hmm. having chance, etc. That was completely fine. It reminded me a lot of Man City in the sense that it was sustained yeah. pressure after pressure after mm -hmm. pressure. And that and it just ended up caving in. As soon as we got the first goal, look, the, the, the floodgates open, we got the second goal as well. The one yeah. thing that did worry me though, and something that Liverpool had under Klopp a few years back and Man City have under Guardiola, which we don't quite possess right now, in my opinion, is that killer instinct. It's that ability to just kill that game off and not give that team a chance. Because up until the 70th minute, 75th minute, we were golden. We were going to win this game comfortably. Forest didn't have a sniff and it was going to be a routine three points. We give away a chance from the corner where Willy Bolly, I believe, heads it onto Declan Rice's hand. That was a yeah. warning sign. And then literally five minutes later, they get a goal. And it makes a 10, more, 10 minutes left much more nervous than it should have been. It turned into, or a, not, not necessarily worrying, but at least was some kind of pressure on us and a bit more nail-biting finish than it should have been. So I'm looking for Arsenal to have that final killer instinct of killing off games, because at 3-0, the game's done. Even if they do make it 3-1, right, they ain't coming back from that. There, there isn't, there's not really a chance. Whereas I see Man City, for example, against Burnley on the opening day. Burnley played very well, but it became 1-0, 2-0. Mm -hmm. In the second half, Burnley had a little bit of momentum, but they killed that as soon as Rodri made it 3-0, and that was game over. I'm looking for Arsenal to do a similar thing, but we don't quite possess it just yet. I think that comes with time, though, no? Yeah, I think the the sustained pressure in the first half was done really well. I think we lacked it in the second half. The mm. second half, I feel like we let the game go by. I think what happens is when you have so much possession is that you lose that instinct to just keep it going, keep it motivated. Players sort of switched off a bit. But yeah, again, I think that what we need to do is I think we need to have that killer instinct, like you said. I think Pep's greatest teams, Pep's best teams had that ability to do that. And if we want to compete we need to have that desire to win the ball back through the 90, not just in the 45 minutes of the first half. We need to come out with that same enthusiasm. But yeah, I think I think overall it was a good game. Kai Havertz had a good debut. I think people give him a bit of time. He will. He, he This was the role for him. And I think just as long as he's able to, to develop that partnership with you know Martinelli and Nketiah, his his role is the best suited for him. He progresses with the ball well, plays, stretches the fence as well. He had he had one of the best like um, pressing abilities and ball carriers in the league. So last season and the season before. So I I think we have a good mixture of you know young and experienced now. But yeah, just need to finish the games off early. Hundred <laughs> percent. I really appreciate you coming on, Rami, with your uh, tactical analysis. Of course, make sure you. 
Follow Rami on Instagram and Twitter, his page of Stats Optic. He breaks down all sorts of football games for all types of clubs, including Arsenal. I'll leave them in the description, his YouTube channel as well, which I'm sure he'll be producing content in the near future. But for now, he's focused on Instagram and Twitter. Anything, anything more to say on your behalf, uh, Rami? Can't wait to be on again. <laughs> it will of be course, a good man. season. I think an exciting season. We saw some good games this weekend. Hope so, hope so. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comment section regarding the game. What did you make of it? Did you see, did you see anything that we missed today? I appreciate everyone that's tuned in. If you're new around here, you have to subscribe down below on my road to 5,000 subscribers. I produce Arsenal content basically daily on this channel as we're reviewing all other Premier League type games. Also become a channel member. If you're a hardcore fan, just like ourselves, it's perfect for you. You get access to exclusive Arsenal preview shows before every single Arsenal game as well as super emotes just for Arsenal fans out there. I've been my I appreciate you guys all for tuning in and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Take care.